At the heart of our struggle to maintain and strengthen a democratic way of life are the nation's schools. Now as never before, American education is challenged to help prepare the new generation for the vital business of acting as free individuals in a free society. The public continues to expect certain immediate results from our schools. Whatever else my children ought to know, when and where important events happen, teach them the facts. In my opinion, make them strong and healthy. My kid ought to do better than me. Why, they ought to be taught to read and write good English. There has always been this rich variety of individual demands. But nowadays, almost every adult agrees on one basic goal for all students. Schools ought to turn out good citizens. Yes, good citizens. That's right. Absolutely, this country always needs good citizens. Teaching students subject matter in democratic situations that develop better citizens is being done more and more in alert school systems. This school happens to be in Michigan. But it could be any other school anywhere. Any school where parents and teachers are concerned about how and what their children learn to prepare them for citizenship. Let's ask some questions. There's Arthur Davis. Not his real name, but it'll do. Teaches American history. Been doing it for years. Let's talk to him. Excuse me, Mr. Davis. We've heard fine reports about this school and about the good things that you and your students have been doing. Can you tell us something about how and why you came to use your present method of teaching? Well, that's pretty big order. I might tell you how I first became interested in trying it out. It's fairly typical of our other teachers' experiences. Our staff, for some time, had been aware of the limitations of its teaching methods. Through considerable reading, committee work, discussion, experimenting, and in meetings with parent and civic groups, we tried to find the answer. The authoritarian method, with the teacher dominating, we felt wasn't the answer. Letting the students do as they pleased, the laissez-faire method, also was inadequate. Neither method produced the best citizen. We discovered, as others have, that the answer sprang from the very nature of our democratic society. In essence, it's to use teaching methods which will produce better citizens while teaching subject matter. Teaching methods which develop and draw upon the knowledge, skills, and attitudes of all the students. Our first problem was to find a workable definition of the characteristics of good citizenship. The Detroit Citizenship Study gave us one of the best answers. But what interests us is, how do you develop these qualities through a regular school program? Well, suppose we take last year's class. No group is identical, of course, but it was an average group. Davis felt the familiar excitement that every teacher feels at the start of a new term. Following my pre-plans rather closely, the first few days were spent on orientation, getting to know each other's names backgrounds and hobbies. Learning is best accomplished among friendly youngsters acquainted with each other. Uh, this is my friend Warren Smith over here. You know, I brought him to school the other day, but he's a dummy. He won't learn anything. <laughs> we talked a little about what we learned in other social studies classes and took several tests to determine how much knowledge of American history the students already had and what their interests and attitudes were. There were the usual number of personal problems that with the democratic method could be adjusted. Helen, Chai, Al, 
domineering and ignoring others' rights, and Harold Corey, Harold always running away from facts. Harold's attitude, for instance, was apparent when the class was choosing among various ways by which the class could be conducted, authoritarian, laissez-faire, or democratic. So how can we run a class democratically? Everyone's for himself. They discussed it from every conceivable angle. Then they voted against the autocratic method with the teacher dominating, against the laissez-faire method with the students doing just about what they pleased. And they settled for the democratic pattern, shared responsibility, mutual respect with the teacher as a resource, a consultant, and a guide to better learning. About what? Well, I'm not sure. Do you think we learn as much by letting us kids run the class? Well, we're not going to run it by ourselves. Mr. Davis is going to help. Well, I don't know. I sort of like what he said, getting everybody's ideas and talking over what we want to do. I think it's fair, and I think we'll learn more. Come on, let's go. They'd begun to see some of the possibilities of working together democratically to share responsibility and set up goals for the year, choose topics to study, to find answers to problems, to think critically, to share and discuss findings, and finally evaluate their accomplishments and discuss together ways of improvement. Harold had been against trying out the new method, but he was popular enough to be elected class chairman. Shared responsibility continued with the election of a secretary, the chairman led the discussion and set up goals. Of course, I had helped by suggestion now and then, and mostly the steps were to read and think individually. Then for each student to make his own list of goals. Next, their ideas were combined and refined in small groups. Finally, the whole class and I got together for discussion. The outcome was this. From the study of American history, they wanted to achieve the following goals. To become a better citizen. To learn how to read and write better. To understand our American way of life. To learn how to solve problems. To understand the United States as a major power in the world today. Parents continued to keep in touch with what was happening. And occasionally, one would be more impatient than the others. Isn't all this a waste of time? After all, your job is to teach American history. Orientation really doesn't waste time, Mr. Corey. You'll find these students interested in learning because they had a part in making the decisions. Okay, but when did you get around to studying history? Well, our next steps were what you would probably call studying history. We selected our first topic for study in the same way as we had established our goals. First, I presented background material and ideas. Then individually, they read and did some thinking. Then discussed topics in small groups. Finally, we arrived at a consensus through class discussion. We chose as our first general topic what democracy means to me. Out of our discussion on the main topic emerged several problems. How did democracy get started and develop? How important is democracy in the world today? How does democracy differ from other forms of government? What contributions have the outstanding leaders made to democracy? How can democracy be improved in our city? Each student voted for the problem he wanted to work on. Four problem groups were formed and a chairman and recorder selected in each. The groups began by filling in work plans. I worked closely with each group. This step was a test as to whether the groups could work democratically. Sometimes they got into trouble.
I think I'd like to preview those film strips on the Constitution. No, I want to do that. I know how to work the projector. Now, wait a minute. Why can't you both do it? Janie knows about the film strips, and Al, you're good with the projector. That sounds like a good way to do it. Yeah, how about it, Al? Well, I guess you're right. I'll try it. The influence of the class gradually was causing Al to respect others. A second group was doing as well. They'd seen the importance of individual responsibility. Now, who's going to report on Jefferson? Oh, Helen, you took a trip to Monticello last summer. How about it? Oh, I'm not sure I could do it. Oh, sure you can. You could use your snapshot, and I'll give you a hand with it. Helen's self-confidence was being bolstered. In time, she'd make a fuller contribution. The third group, however, was tussling with our local skeptic. Mr. Davis, we're not getting any place. Well, what seems to be the trouble? Can't seem to get started. In spite of what Harold Corey has to say, we still think we have some democracy in this town. No, we haven't. We just think we have. All politicians are crooked. Everything's fixed. What are your facts, Harold? We just know, that's all. Everybody knows it. Hey, do you have any facts to prove your point? I'm sorry. We'll never get any place this way. Why don't you give us an assignment, Mr. Davis? Now, just a minute, folks. Faye says our community is democratic. Harold says it isn't. Now, they both can't be right. How can we find the truth? Look. We talked about what democracy meant in orientation. Now let's talk with people around town here and see what they think. Do some more reading on it and discuss it again. I think we ought to know for sure what we're talking about. A very good idea, Warren. How about the rest of you? Shall we do it? Yes, that's a good idea. Why couldn't we visit the mayor for the first thing? They were learning a basic lesson. Democracy doesn't operate by itself in a vacuum. Critical thinking based upon facts is very important. And so they worked, they struggled, they planned, and they grew. Each group was now engrossed in its problems. Students found the library a valuable source for needed information. Outsiders may have been surprised at their eagerness. But for teachers using this method, it's a familiar and rewarding result. Local citizens had to think twice when asked to compare democracy with other forms of government. The community's mayor and city manager were interviewed by one of our groups. was introduced to an exciting new world of facts. While each individual talent found a way to contribute, each group organized its growing mass of information. Our class had become a team, and every student was the better for it. The projects were nearly complete. At last, each group made its report. Helen? Thank you. This is Station W, USA. Today we have a most unusual program featuring early leaders of our democracy. The year, 1787. Our speakers, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Alexander Hamilton. Their topic for discussion is the need for a federal constitution. Mr. Washington will present his views first. Madam Chairman, fellow countrymen, the reasons for a federal constitution are social, economic, military, and political. I shall discuss these one at a time. Our group worked on the problem, how did democracy get started and developed? Our report is built around a series of film strips in chapter three in our textbook. Jane Cook will introduce the first film strip and lead discussion while Al will run our projector. Our group has studied the problem 
how can democracy be improved in our city? We couldn't all agree, so we decided to give individual reports and to invite two leading citizens who could talk with us, Mrs. Hoyt and Mrs. Emerson. Mrs. Emerson, chairman of the League of Women Voters, will suggest how young people and adults can work together to improve democracy in our city. Mrs. Emerson? Mr. Chairman and members of the class, our organization is concerned with this matter. We're glad that you are discussing it in class because, you see, we need citizens who not only talk about democracy, but who are willing to work to improve it. Harold Corey will report what he found out from the mayor. Harold? Thanks. At first, I've got to admit, I thought I knew all the answers to this problem. Then we visited the mayor. The mayor changed my mind about a lot of things. He had solutions to several problems. They were... <laughs> Harold's father should have heard that. He wanted Harold to learn the facts. Class discussion following each of the reports revealed some important conclusions. Interest was greater. Facts were learned better and remembered longer because they were related to very real, everyday problems. This was also clearly shown through various kinds of evaluations by the entire class, on worksheets by each group. By taking several kinds of achievement tests. And through teacher-pupil conferences between myself and each student. Al, uh, I've just been looking over your progress sheet. Uh, tell me, why didn't you evaluate yourself on uh, respecting rights of others? How do I rate myself on that? I never thought about it much till I got in this class. I don't know what to do about it anyway. Well, you already have done something about it. I have? Certainly. You've recognized that you have this problem. That's the first step towards improvement. Well, I have listened to people without interrupting them. Good. What else could I do? In conferences like this one, I could gauge the extent to which my students were improving. Gradually, in the give and take of the class sessions, Al had begun to develop more respect for the rights of others. Helen gained self-confidence and became a responsible member of the group. Harold, in making skillful use of information, was reaching towards maturity. In this class, some grew a great deal, some grew a little, but all gained something from their experience. A last question, Mr. Davis. Can other subjects be taught this way? They certainly can, and many are. Actually, I haven't been talking just about American history. I've described a democratic method of teaching which can be used to varying degrees by any teacher on any grade level in any subject. For example, here is a third grade on a field trip which they have planned to get first-hand information about their questions in science. Here is a sixth grade class sharing their findings as to how fractions are used in their homes. Here is a Latin student and his teacher evaluating his progress through a teacher-student interview. It's true, there are easier ways to teach but I know of no more effective way to help our students learn. Not only to learn more facts, but to learn how to put democracy into practice. These days, parents and teachers alike realize it must be their serious concern to help our young people become better citizens. For democracy is not only an effective use of facts, but a dynamic way of people living and working together. America's youth, our next generation, must be prepared to help build their future. A vital step in that direction is practicing democracy in the classroom.